welcome everyone to this session of the Kanban Coaching Exchange. Tonight we have a very interesting topic for me because I've always been very interested in prioritization. So Cesar is going to talk to us about upstream Kanban and prioritizing using the value rate. And without further ado, I'll pass you on to him so he can tell us a bit more about himself and the event tonight. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so thank you, Vlad. Really appreciate it. I'm seeing lots of people uh, in here, very full uh, event. So thank you all for joining. I hope to live up to your expectations uh, today. I've, it's something that I've put into, uh, put a lot of work into. So definitely keen to get uh, feedback. I'm going to share my uh, screen and you're going to see the first uh, slide here. Now, immediately for those that uh, prefer a mobile experience, you've got a QR code and that is repeated here. And this is uh, a landing page that I created I, this is how I normally um, do these things. I create a short link and that has the link to the slides. It has uh, all sorts of other materials and uh, that you can get. And uh, it is uh, going to also be persistent after the event. And it will have, in fact, let me show you on the world board here. So it looks something like this. And you can provide feedback afterwards. You can upload photos if there are any photos that you happen to, to take or you want to add anything annotated. Uh, you can even book a session at your company by following a link here. Um, I will also add the link to the YouTube video once it's uh, posted. So you'll have everything in one place and even the activities, assuming that it all totally works, uh, will be, um, I'll take screenshots of that and the images will be posted here for the six uh, activities uh, that I have for the group. And then, of course, uh, there will be some discounts. And the platform was not uh, active earlier today when I was trying to set this up. So uh, two weeks of discounts will be available for all of you attending uh, this event today. And the links will be shown here. Uh, all right, so back to slides. So this is a um, part of one of the modules of a cohort program that I run, both in private and public context, and it focuses on prioritization using business value, and specifically value rate. Uh, for those of you that want to find out a little bit about me, you can go to this other short link on my site, go.mba30.com slash Cesar. And very quickly, um, I actually lived in the UK for 19 years, even though now I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I've got a master's degree from Imperial, that's in control systems engineering, and a master's in finance from London Business School, which definitely puts me in a better position to talk about these topics and develop these materials when it's about business value. I worked at JP Morgan for 10 years, uh, was promoted pretty fast to VP in about four years out of the, out of the 10. And then another uh, big bank brought me to uh, the uh, Bay Area, and that was Barclays. And I've been here in the US for about 17 years now. Um, after the financial crisis in 2009, I went consulting and I consulted through various companies, um, longest of which was at Lab Zero, which is a boutique uh, consulting company here in the Bay Area. And then a couple of years ago, I started my own uh, consulting training and coaching company. I've consulted at some very big clients and I've got various accreditations. The most recent one is this uh, Certified uh, Profit Streams Trainer. I think there might be one of uh, 30 of us in the world at the moment, maybe fewer. This is the uh, Luke Homan um, uh, Software Profit Streams certification that he just launched this year. Uh, also with uh, Influential You, which is about uh, applying philosophy to the business context and helping leaders move more powerfully together. Uh, safe certification, just because people need rescuing and if left to their own devices, it's actually really difficult to make it uh, workable. And then of course, I've got my own uh, programs, uh, this one and uh, Test Driven Agility uh, developed jointly with Rick Dreyfus. But today we're talking about prioritization and I will do this once because I know that this is a much more international audience than perhaps what this is originally designed for. Uh, here you go, I'll fix it, that's it. Um, there will be some mixed content between the US and the uh, British uh, spelling, I uh, warn you in advance, most of it is US but a little bit of it will be uh, UK because of the work that I've done in both uh, regions and partnering with both people. So if it's a screenshot of something that happened at a particular time, uh, then you'll have the spelling of that particular region at that particular time. So um, do people know what uh, this is? Uh, are folks familiar with this? Have you all seen uh, the optimized end-to-end -end board? I see some uh, fantastic faces in the uh, grid here. 
a quick show of hands or uh, something in the chat would be totally fine. Uh, oh, I see Alexei. Wow, I'm honored. Um, welcome, Alexei. And of course, uh, lots of other people that I haven't had a chance to quite take in yet. I've got a thumbs up from Amy. Uh, thank you for that. And a thumbs up from ooh, uh, Hal and Joao and Doa. So quite a few people have seen this. Now, you might recognize the board, but maybe uh, you might detect that I did my best to fix the fisheye effect of the original. Um, so this is in some of the learning material from Kanban University, uh, which several of the people here are accredited to teach, myself included. And what this shows is uh, the full end-to-end, -end, upstream all the way to downstream, and maybe to some extent you could see uh, beyond. So you've got the downstream starts about here, and that is when things go from on deck to in development somewhere in there. That's uh, that's the downstream. And the upstream is everything, including the highest aperture funnel right at the beginning and all of the stages through which the work might mature. Now, this is great. And there are different techniques that some people, in fact, here may have contributed to publishing. There are triage tables. Uh, there are all sorts of ways to there's the, the upstream uh, Kanban uh, booklet. Uh, amazing stuff that helps us. However, we still have a problem, I think, that goes unresolved, um, or at least that's been my experience. So I want to speak into that and provide one additional technique that may come in handy if you're not already using it. Now, if I take that upstream and downstream and I expand a little bit to show you what I mean, and by the way, if you just joined, that's the short link to get all of the materials, to get the slides in the future, to get this video, uh, to get the link to the mural board, just go to that short link, go to mba30.com slash kce23. And that's, I'll have that uh, comment at the bottom often throughout the slides so that people can go back and uh, use it. So we've got that upstream, feeding that downstream, and everything's great, isn't it? Well, except that then uh, some new work arrives. And this particular work item, it's going to activate some dependent service requests. And it might just activate a request in, in order for it to proceed, to progress, to advance through this original uh, board, it hits a dependent service, maybe it's a team that has exclusive access to the payments module, and so we need to change something, in the payments module, and only that team can do it. For whatever reason, uh, they're the ones that need to do it, and we send that request to them, and there are techniques for prioritizing that in Kanban, in more advanced, uh, more uh, higher maturity level Kanban. Um, and then that those requests and those dependencies might be nested to the nth degree. The bigger the organization is, the more chances there are of that happening. Uh, and as the work progresses, maybe it hits and activates some additional requests somewhere else. So the work in those other services has to be delivered, completed, and turned around for the work in the original uh, board at the uh, top in purple can progress and be completed. So this tends to add a lot of delays, a lot of handoffs. And yes, one way to fix that is to not have those at all. And I'm a big proponent of uh, the best way to solve the problem is to not have the problem in the first place. But your mileage may vary. And the problem that I'm trying to solve is that, particularly for the dependent services, this is the experience. They tend to experience a million different requests. Okay, maybe not a million. Let's say a dozen different requests that all look completely indistinguishable in priority to this one, to the purple one, because those are all of the different teams that are asking us for work, that are making requests of our team. It's all their priority number one. So how do we discern which of those priority number ones, 12 of them, is the actual priority number one that we should focus on first and do without delay? I'm going to come back to some of the techniques that you might have heard of, and this is just something in addition that may help you further. And we have the same problem, I would say, in the upstream. In the upstream, we might have a small army of designers and product leaders and you know creative people, and they see an abundance of opportunity, lots of options in the market, and maybe they also need to do some work to narrow down the request to just the most important ones. But how do we help that to happen? These are the things that I think are the problem that I'm uh, contributing uh, a solution to that may uh, come in handy. And you saw in the description of this uh, meetup event that I described my uh, experience uh, driving uh, through US freeways. In fact, these are two points of the same freeway. This is Interstate 5, which goes from roughly where I am. It's a few, you know, maybe 20 minutes from my house. And it goes north to south uh, to LA. And in fact, I'll be on this uh, freeway tomorrow. I'm driving down to LA on my way to San Diego for the Kanban Leadership Retreat, uh, which is uh, next week. 
So at some parts uh, in the middle of California, uh, the freeway looks like the one on the right. And on that one, everybody wants to go first. And everybody's driving for some strange reason on the left-hand side, and maybe a few tra trucks, not a lot of traffic on the right-hand side. And they're all trying to, they're all hoping that the car in front of them will get out of the way and they, they never do. So it is a pretty terrible driving experience for somebody who's driven on German uh, Autobahn. Um, and I'm sure uh, some of you must have done. And the other terrible experience is the eight lane freeway further down closer or within uh, the, the short radius of LA. And that is uh, traffic that could maybe go up to 65 miles an hour in terms of speed limit, but because of the volume of traffic, it's maybe moving at 45 uh, miles an hour and it's just boring uh, or maybe it's just dead stopped in some cases. So this one on the left is the experience of the teams when they have undifferentiated priority. It all looks the same. It's all going to go at whatever speed. Maybe we have too much whip and it ends up clogged up in this way. So it means that everyone's late. So that's the outcome. In this one on the right, this is the me first uh, problem. So this might be a first in, first out sort of queue as well. Uh, so we don't care which one has priority. We don't care how much people scream. Maybe we do. Uh, but we just go, hey, we got this request first, so that's the one we're working on, and then whatever comes next, uh, we work on that. That's fine. Now, of course, somebody then has the brilliant idea, takes a combined class with uh, any number of people here in this uh, very good, uh, excellent uh, group, and they realize, oh, class of service. If we just introduce this class of service called Expedite, we'll solve it. I have invented the ambulance. The traffic will magically open up this um, invisible lane that I didn't realize existed and let the ambulance go through. Yeah, um, maybe, and maybe not so much, because then this is actually a pattern that I have observed uh, all too often. Uh, every request turns into an ambulance, uh, and we can limit whip on that expedite swim lane all we want. It'll just get escalated, and then we will have the more and more and more senior people screaming that their thing is the true expedite and we're back to undifferentiated we're back to the same problem and of course if all the ambulances are stuck in traffic then everyone is dead doesn't help us at all enter value rate optimization i'm going to borrow from and build on the work of other people as you can see i'm already doing that optimizely Kanban university and so on i'm going to name some additional specific people uh, in this uh, context but first let me say that value rate optimization is not just uh, in fact, not at all, a new or better answer, it's asking a completely different question. So it is a system-wide priority inheritance technique. So imagine if the priority that is set, uh, when it's identified as an opportunity, as an option, actually propagates through the system with ease. And it's obvious to everyone. So sequencing and trade-off decisions uh, are obvious. Also, it might really highlight that there is one and only one thing that must be done without delay, and even if, if it only accomplishes that, this will be extremely powerful because that might be the thing that is most expensive to delay and the teams themselves and then the other dependent uh, uh, teams have no visibility of uh, what is the cost of that delay. So of course, now you begin to hear some of the terminology that might be familiar to you on which I'm basing this. It is not, however, return on investment, uh, value over the uh, total cost, project approval process, or intended to be the value of your piece of the work. It is the total value that will be activated in market that we're focusing on. So let's go a little bit deeper into this and talk about value. Now we've had several ways, and I've already mentioned several, but let me mention two more ways of trying to convey that we want to deliver value incrementally, that things have value and you can have different levels of value. Here's one way that we have seen this, uh, Henrik Nieberg saying, don't do it like this because there's no value uh, you don't satisfy the customer until the end. You might do it like this. Uh, the, the customer always has a means of transportation uh, throughout uh, as a particular uh, thinking uh, structure for how we might consider value. And of course, we've got Jeff Patton, uh, separating incrementing versus iterating. And you know, how, does, how do you deliver value? How do, we, how do we optimize towards ensuring that the value is actually delivered? And uh, what is the difference between these two techniques? And all these are great starting points for thought experiments and for changing the way that we actually work. But fundamentally, this is my take. Uh, we do not want to slice value, and I hope that that's a Photoshop, not an actual picture, because I, if I'm not mistaken, cutting up a $100 bill or any uh, US currency like that is uh, uh, actually legal. I found that picture. I didn't take that picture. Don't report me. 
Uh, but I did take the picture on the right. Uh, so we don't want to deliver, we don't want to pretend that this incremental value equates to the original value of the intact $100 bill, but we do want to capture incrementally the value along the way. And if we do, and if we're learning in the process, not just uh, delivering to a spec in increments, then occasionally one of those $10 bills, so the keen eyed of you might have spotted, there's $110 on the right, whereas there's what is pretending to be $100 on the left. On the right, there's an opportunity that uh, emerges which gives you extra value, and that is made possible by that incremental approach. Um, so let's talk about more specifically uh, how to make an extra $20, $23 million out of um, your existing system without hiring anybody else, without training anybody else, pretty much for free, just through the art of value rate uh, prioritization. So again, back to value. Now, specifically, without information about value, the system optimizes for other things. And I would really love to get some perspective with a quick dot voting on a mural board. And this might make for a fun and very interesting experience with this many people on the mural board. Let's see if it works. If not, I've got some additional slides that I can quickly show you as vis visuals. But we're going to go to the mural board and do exercise 1.1 to see where we are as a group. And on that, if I switch there, you should have the links uh, already available to you, but I'm going to paste them yet again in the chat. But they're in that short link that several people, uh, Vlad several times has pasted. Here's the mural link if you want to go directly. And once you follow that mural link, you'll come into the board and I should see uh, 40, 50, however many you are. You are now uh, 58 people, something like that. So let's see how many we get. All right. And once we get there, I'm going to start a dot voting session. Now, you don't all have to do this if you're just listening in and not participating. That's totally fine. Uh, so I'm going to wait for a few seconds and then I'm going to set up a voting session. Now, I am sharing on the screen. So obviously, you don't vote on my screen. You vote on your own screen. But I'm sharing the screen for the recording. And here, the first question that I have for you is, what are we optimizing for now? So I'm going to open a dot voting session. And the dot voting session is only going to have one vote per person for everyone who is here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring everybody to me. So I'm going to summon the 25 people that thank you that you joined. Uh, and then I'm going to set up a voting session. And you, you'll see it up here. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Hang on a second. All right, start a voting session. So optimize now. Everyone gets one vote. Uh, everyone gets to vote only on sticky notes. And if I haven't messed this up, on selected section. And that should be just this part. All right, let's see if I did that correctly. You only get one vote, so pick whichever one is closest to your experience. And I'm going to say start. Okay, begin voting. All right, so I'm only going to give you about a minute. Uh, so let's put that on the timer. And meanwhile, I'll talk you through these. So some of you might be optimizing on value. Other people might be optimizing on stakeholder for satisfaction. Uh, employee utilization, that's quite common. Um, it varies per team, that's fine. Uh, maybe you don't optimize at all. Just deliver to whatever project definition you have. Maybe you don't know. All of those are totally fine. I see that some content was added, but we're not gonna vote on those. Predictability, anybody up, uh, optimizing for predictability if you are uh, implementing and maturing your organization through the Kanban maturity model, that maybe give you some good results there. All right, about 20 seconds to go. Uh, let's see um, how we are doing. If I pull that down, already voted. It's quite a few, 22 people, six people left to vote, but it's looking like it's not progressing. So with 22 people and it's about to close, I'm gonna end the voting session. Great. And for everyone, let's see what happened. All right, these are the results. Now, what is the key thing to get from these results? And th this happens every time, whatever uh, the group, inside of a company, in a public group like this, there is a very low maximum of votes given to any one thing. In this case, three votes, each to predictability, employee utilization, and varies per team. And two votes for each of these, and one vote for each of those. So speed or customer satisfaction, sure, some might optimize for that. Only two people claim that they optimize or their group, their 
company optimizes for value. And then some say, none of these. We optimize for something completely different. But it's all over the place. Now, I put this to you. If we're all optimizing for different things, then we can't possibly be optimizing for value. And if we don't have the information about value, we can't possibly optimize for it. So that's why we end up optimizing for proxies or alternatives or just things that are entirely, entirely different. Let's go back to our regular programming here. Thank you for participating in that. Now, uh, the first person I'm going to borrow from is Don Reinertsen. And the quote that I'm sure you've seen, uh, a few of you may have seen before, he says in the book, I think it's actually in the preface of the book, uh, I believe that the dominant paradigm for managing product development is wrong, not just a little wrong, but wrong to its very core. And this was written, I think, back in 2006, something like that, uh, thereabouts. Now, this is um, common even today. So I don't know that it has, has had quite as much uh, impact. Here he is. Um, and the uh, economic principle that we're going to focus, he's got 175 uh, principles throughout the book. Um, definitely a useful book to, to get, uh, not an easy read, but incredibly powerful and consequential for the, um, uh, what you, the value that you might get in your organization. Um, but I have had some um, uh, challenges with this, not the notion itself. Applying it is fine. It's the terms. It's funny to use a term that is actually a measure of value and not use the word value at all. So let me fix that. If you only quantify one thing, quantify the value rate. It is a rate of, let's say, dollar, pound, euro value per unit of time. So it's a rate of value. Let's just call it a value rate. It's called all sorts of different things. Um, not even going to go further into that. So this is something on which I'm building Don Reinertsen's uh, work. Here are two other lovely people uh, whose work I am uh, leveraging and who I have worked with. I have done workshops with uh, as well. So. You know, they uh, did pave some of the ground uh, before me and, uh, and, and you all. Now, they wrote this wonderful experience report on Merce Klein, where Uslim at the time was uh, working and Joshua was uh, consulting. And they presented it at Agile 2013. Now, if you want to go to the page where you can download on, uh, I think it's Joshua's website, uh, Blackstone Farming, uh, that's a QR code for that. Or you can, I've got a short link that goes to, to them. Uh, so this is just my short link, but it goes to their page. So again, go.mba3o.com for the short link. And then the specific one is BSF, which is Black Swan Farming dash Maersk. Or you can just use, and it's in the slides, uh, the full link, direct link uh, there as well. So what do they share with us in that experience report? Well, they do the analysis and actually in some of the work that I've done with them, particularly with Joshua, whenever one of his clients or one of my clients, whenever we paired, and work together on, on uh, any of this, and we've done this similar exercise, it always comes out with this sort of shape. It's a sort of power curve uh, type of uh, shape. There are a few items that have a very high value if you sort them by value per week, by value per unit of time. Another way of saying that is that the top quartile of all of the requests, requirements, tend to have three orders of magnitude more benefits uh, than the bottom quartile. So let's examine a little bit further where we are as a group and do another quick uh, dot vote. In fact, we're going to do two exercises, 1.2 and 1.3. So back on the board, if you can rejoin that, I'll unhide and go bring everybody to this uh, other um, part of the board. Uh, what is the least valuable thing that you're working on right now that your team, your area, your group is working on right now? Is it worth $100 per week or less? Will it activate and market $100 per week or less? Or $1,000 per week, $10,000, $100,000? This is the least valuable thing in your general area. Let me summon everybody, 29 people to me. And I'm going to do uh, voting, start voting session. And this is least valuable. Uh, sticky notes, any member on a selection. And the selection is going to be, whoa, that's, why did it stay there? I don't mean that. Let me fix that. Selection is going to be here, and I'm going to start the dot voting. So whoever's here, begin voting now. Now I'm going to give you even less time. I'm going to put it on my watch. So just about 30 seconds time uh, just to move fast here. I uh, just need a good sampling of the, um, oh, not 30 minutes. It's crazy. All right. Here we go. Um, and, uh, well, I can also track how many people are left to vote by clicking here, and you can see that uh, 19 people have already voted. I think before it was something like 24, 25. So when we hit that, I'd definitely stop. But if I hit 30 seconds and we're there, 
and I might just stop. So 20 people voted. Let's take a look, 22, almost out of time. Clicking in three, two, one, gone. All right, end session for everyone. Let's see how we did. Oh, this is also super common, super common. We don't know how valuable the least valuable thing is. And then there are some other things and some folks, uh, one person has something where uh, that they're working on that is the least valuable thing and that is expected to produce $100,000 per week or more once it's complete. It's a big program. So that is fascinating, isn't it? Let's try the next one. So the next one, while, we, while we're here, I'm going to unhide. I'm going to navigate to it, zoom out a little bit, bring everybody to me. All right. So now what is the most valuable? Let's flip that question. And it now starts at $100,000 per week. So the most valuable thing that you are your area is working on. What? How valuable is that? So let's take a look. Looks like we've got people still joining. That's fantastic. All right. So this is the most valuable. Sticky notes, one vote, and it's going to be on this area. Give me one second to that properly and zoom in a little bit. All right. Start. 30 seconds again. So 30 seconds. What is the most valuable? How valuable is the most valuable thing that you're working on? If you don't know, the question marks uh, will help you there. If you happen to have a general order of magnitude, that's all we're looking for in this sampling of uh, going through. Oh, 22 people voted really fast. 23 even. 24. All right. So maybe I'll just end it uh, even in less than the, about the 30 seconds and the voting session. Let's see what that data tells us. 20 votes, even more than before, question marks. Okay, so we don't know. That is very common. And what it calls for is for us to raise our fitness in the language of value. And that does mean calculating the dollars and cents, calculating that, um, oh, and some screenshots. I will be posting the screenshots in um, the, uh, I'm not sure if that was me or somebody else. I'm going to remove that. Uh, but I will be posting screenshots of all of this into, uh, you can see the link there at the bottom of the page, just to say it one more time. If you go to the short link, go.mba3o.com slash kce23. That has the slides, and eventually we'll have all of this material, all of these results uh, as well. So yeah, that is a problem, isn't it? Uh, let's see, looks like there's somebody that's asking to be admitted, uh, that's uh, showing up on my screen. So I don't know if Vlad, you can admit that additional person, or if it's just the message that shows up for me. All right. So let's move to the next topic, value. Value is a function of time. Maybe not in the way that we most commonly uh, want to perceive it or want to measure it. So this particular part tends to be experienced by people a little bit like this. This is The Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dalí, 1931. Uh, Salvador Dalí, of course, from Spain, uh, as am I. I wish I was as creative as that. I am not. The best I can do in terms of graphics are ugly graphics like this, but hopefully they convey the message. So when does value show up? Let's start exploring that part of prioritization. We need to understand where value shows up so that we know what we're measuring. So there is a period of time from when somebody has an idea, remember that Optimizely board? Way at the beginning to the start date. So this is entirely in the upstream. So even before that first downstream team does any work, never mind require the work of other dependent services. So once that happens, work happens, right? Once we get that point and it's ready to get started, work happens. And once the work is completed, we generate some value. And this number is actually connected to the example, the case that I'm sharing with you. Uh, $750,000 per week estimated benefit. Now, very importantly, this was something that was measured after the fact. So the question was, how much value is this thing that you already finished generating for you now? Well, we just went live a few weeks ago, and already we can see it's $750,000 per week uh, of uh, pretty accurate, but still estimated benefits. It might have been 325, 375, but it's in that ballpark. So uh, quite often, agile techniques, maybe even Kanban, is used exclusively in the execution or delivery part of the work. And it does bring an improvement, but your results might be marginal compared to what's available to you. So we do the same work, 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 but it's just a little bit faster. So that is a problem. 
it still gives us some extra cash flows. So notice that I didn't move the original cash flow. That cash flow was anchored to a time period. That's an important concept. What happened here is that for the additional time period that we gained, we are now able to activate the additional completely separate and distinct cash flow uh, for an extra $750,000. So really what we're asking is, what are we trying to do? Let's say with business agility, let's say with upstream Kanban prioritization, we want to avoid this lost value. But you will say reasonably, but wait, Cesar, this is not available to us. How can you measure that as the value when we haven't even started the work? Well, precisely. Instead, start without delay. Make sure that the thing that is most valuable by whatever metric we're choosing, but in dollars and cents, no proxies, no Fibonacci scale, no any of that other stuff that is out in the world, all of those are training wheels and they will help you understand the technique, but only dollars and cents or whatever your currency might be helps you achieve this and more. So start without delay and that will give you all of these time periods where you have active value available for you to turn on. Bon, seconde, faut que ce truc. Oh, might need uh, to mute unless it was a question. Um, I'm going to move on. All right, so we're going to take three quick surveys back on the board and see where we are with this topic. So now we're in the topic of basic time. And I'm going to move us, change my screen so I don't have to look sideways. I'm going to move us to build time. So let's talk about how long, uh, what is the typical duration of a software product initiative uh, build from start to finish? And oh, something's happening. And uh, yep, see if we can remove that. Thank you. All right, appreciate it. So build time, what is the typical duration of a software um, initiative uh, build time from start to finish? And just get rid of that, I think. So, sorry if I uh, left something unlocked and it's causing that problem. I'm gonna start a, I'm gonna bring you all to me first. I must remember to always do that, 30 people now on the board. Uh, and I'm gonna start a voting session. Um, and I'm gonna call that uh, build. Again, all the parameters are set and correct, and it keeps doing this to me. I don't know why it's changed. It didn't used to do that. I'm going to bring that voting to this part of the screen. Now zoom back into it and click start. All right, so vote on uh, how long it takes uh, to build something in your area. Are you delivering something every you know, few weeks, every three months, every six months, every year, or no idea? Uh, this time, I'm just going to check how many people vote. 21 already voted, so if it gets to about 25, I'm going to end the voting session. Uh, or maybe I'll count it down. 24. Ah, that's close enough. All right, end voting session. Here we go. What are the results? Well, here we see a different concentration, different distribution of data. Nine people say that it takes about six months to build something and get it out the door. Uh, or three months, or some have no idea. A few people say a year, two years, and so on. Only one person in this group of, what, how many people uh, do we have? 52 people at the moment say that it's going to be two weeks or less. Well, congratulations. Uh, that's fantastic. But you are the exception, apparently. Let's go to the next one. The next one is this concept to cash question. What is the total lead time? Now, if any of you have taken some of the Kanban classes uh, out there in the world, then maybe you already have this terminology uh, uh, down. But this is the total concept to cash. So from the moment the idea comes up to when the um, item first generates, uh, let's say dollar value uh, in market, um, maybe equates to customer lead time. So I'm gonna bring you all to me once again, set up uh, this voting session, Just bear with me. Concept to cash, you're seeing the sausage being made. And then I have to move this thing rather than it being magically where I need it to be. All right, so I'm gonna say vote there, click start. So concept to cash. Now the total lead time obviously must be at least as long as the build time because it includes it, right? So if this is the customer lead time and that was the system lead time in Kanban parlance, then this one must be longer, but how much longer? Is it really close? Is it very different? Let's see what results we get. Uh, already 23 people have completed their voting, so I'm going to close this one real quick. 25 people, three, two, one, ending the voting session and moving us forward. Here we go. A year by uh, just a little bit and no idea as the runner-up. That is quite dramatic. 
a year, or we don't even know in terms of uh, what results we're experiencing of um, this concept of cash uh, performance. So final one, sources of delays. But rather than trying to unpack the sources of delays, let's talk about what we could possibly do. Now, if this is a gut feel, so it's that sort of survey, you don't have to prove it or discuss it. But if you if your organization could simply focus entirely on the thing that you believe has the highest value, how much less time would it take to complete? Could you do it in half the time? Maybe less. Would you only need 60% of the time? Would you do it in 90% of the time? So maybe my question is poorly phrased. This is, would it take you about as long? All the way down to it would only take us half of the time. So that's what we're measuring. So once again, I'm going to bring you to me. I'm going to set up uh, the voting session. Uh, I'm going to call it faster question mark. And I'm going to bring the voting canvas to this part. Whoa, there. Zoom back in and start the voting session. All right, off you go. Let's vote. Let's see how we do. Could we do it in half of the time? If we could really focus and have nothing else, no distractions, no delays, we're going at the speed that we know we can go. We don't have too much whip. It's, an, it's ideal conditions. How fast could we do it? Half of the time, 60% of the time, 90% of the time, about the same, it would make no difference. Uh, all right, 21 people have voted. I'll give you a few more seconds to ponder the question and answer. Accordingly, 23 people voted. Three, two, one, let's see how we do. So, again, by quite some considerable distance, half of the people here-ish, well, I guess 10 out of whatever 24 voted, uh, think that we could do it in half the time. And runner-up says that we could do it in 60% of the time. So shave off 40% of the total duration end-to-end -end of that lead time. That's amazing. And it's going to be even more powerful when you see what we're going to do with the um, racing the um, fitness and fluency in the language of value in uh, our organizations. Uh, we've got about the same time in a couple of cases. Yep, that can happen. Uh, it might not be as common, but it's not unreasonable. All right, back to the slides. So let me walk you through this, change my screens again real quick. Got some other people. So uh, just to rem remind you, we're trying to identify the way of thinking and the way of doing the math, if there's math to be done, and typically it's pretty simple math, to make some to generate some extra value for free you're just basically hemorrhaging value and you don't even know it so this is a real wall um it was a writable blue board instead of a whiteboard um and we printed some of the work some of the items that they had worked on the ones with post-its they had completed the ones without post-its were uh, on their roadmap and we basically did a calibration of the order of magnitude of value uh here so the the one on the right was um seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars per week then we showed a plot once we had that data of when they what was the sequence in which they started the work and they started something that had some value but almost didn't register in this chart uh, and then they did the second initiative and that had closer to a hundred thousand uh, dollars value per week then a little bit less and a little bit more and essentially it took them quite a while before they got this one even started never mind delivered so this is sorted by start date and then according to value so what we want to do is to make sure that we sort by our understanding of value at the time when we're making the decision. And then we need to get better and better at calibrating that estimation of value to the actual performance and the value that we generate. And as we get just minimally better at that, this makes this can make millions of dollars of difference. Uh, it's actually not unusual to have access to twice the total profit within the first calendar year just by following this prioritization technique. In this particular case, this one single project uh, generated and had already been completed $750,000 of value per week. They had had seven months delay, meaning they could reasonably have started this, admitted by that the group involved, they could have started it seven months earlier. Seven months at a rate of $750,000 per week is a revenue opportunity, in this case it was revenue, not profit, of almost $23 million. And that was just one project. That was the one that needed to be started and completed without delay. And if we just started it at the right time and still did it at the same speed as before, we would have made an extra $23 million. That is what this uh, technique is, is uh, meant to do. And that is the work of Don Reinertsen. And of course, I mentioned uh, Joshua Arnold and Oslo Museum. 
So what is the pattern? And there isn't enough time in this sort of meetup, this sort of sequence for us to get into the details and the calculations. I do have a program for that, for those of you that are interested or if you want to uh, contact me and find out a little bit more. And that is a pattern of three steps for getting the organization to start talking about value and using value in this way. First, a step you cannot skip. We have to start calculating actual value for things that are already completed. So there is little or no ambiguity as to how much value we left on the table. Uh, I'm not tracking questions in the chat, so I'm just pay attention to some of this right here. How is value estimated? Well, that's where the work is. But actually, if you're doing business cases or if you've got some other data available, you can also already use that data just in this way, in this approach, in order to get a very different sequencing result. Um, and if you are just uh, the team and you have access to none of this data, then the problem that you're facing is that all of the work that you're getting from maybe multiple stakeholders looks completely undifferentiated to you, whereas one of them is worth $750,000 per week. And every week that you don't have it done, the company fails to make $750,000. So that is what we're trying to do as a consequence. Upstream, they have the numbers. Trust me, everywhere I go, everywhere I've done consulting on this, uh, this uh, learning cohort on this, or this short presentation, those people already have the numbers and they can come up with this way of prioritizing it. The next thing that needs to happen is that it needs to propagate through the system. For that, that means that we're calculating a value rate of the opportunities, of the options in front of us so that we can then choose and sequence them correctly. But that's not all of the benefit of taking this value rate approach. Again, no proxies, no substitutes, no ratios, no Fibonacci, real dollars and cents. And then it'll start bad. It won't be very accurate, but quickly we, the fitness and the fluency starts to really calibrate and they become really good at estimating value and then delivering that value or more. But then the additional benefit is that we can use value rate to make economic trade-offs. And this is the trade-off where um, I remember a, a technology leader uh, was being asked by the DevOps team for funding to buy, I think it was two, three more uh, servers, and it was $50,000 a pop. Now, should is that a good investment? Is it a bad investment? It's $50,000, three servers, so it's $150,000. How do we decide? Well, fortunately, we'd already done this work there, and he had read the book cover to cover as well over a weekend, which was amazing. Uh, again, hard to do. And uh, he knew that the uh, value rate that uh, could reasonably be expected from the work that that entire group was doing was about $15 million a week. And he had already begun to validate that with people on the sales side, on the marketing side, on the business side. And he was getting more and more confident that that was the ballpark, the order of magnitude of, of that benefit. So then his question wasn't, can you justify it and can you give me, you know, no. The question was, if you get those three servers, how much sooner can we deliver? And between them, they figured out that it was probably going to be about a month earlier. Great. So you're telling me that you want to make me an extra $15 million. Uh, sorry, it was $15 million a month. I said a week. It wasn't a week. It was per month. So you want to make me $115 uh, million because you're delivering a month earlier. So we'll activate an extra $15 million. And that's going to cost me $150,000. I'll take that investment every day of the week. It was obvious, but only because they have done the previous two steps and then this shows up as possible. So let me give you some of the terminology and some of the thinking concepts that will set you up to start your journey here. So when looking at value, we need to differentiate and be very precise with language. Uh, here's one term, active value. Active value is not return on investment. I'm going to do a quick segue on that. If this is a value profile of what we can reasonably expect, a return on investment calculation, particularly one that uses net present value discounting of all of these cash flows back to today, will have a number for NPV for this uh, cash flow profile. And if we delay by four weeks, it then discounts all of this. And even at today's higher interest rates than we've had uh, for quite a while, it still discounts to a similar number. So these two situations, that and this, from an ROI perspective, they actually look almost like the same number. What is actually happening, particularly when you have this window of opportunity that is closing, is this. You are giving up the first four cash flows. But wait, it's worse. You are giving up the rate of run-up and ramp-up, and therefore you're entering that window of opportunity late, and it has this effect. So actually, a four-week delay in this simple visual example, I'm trying to convey, might cost you half of the total value. 
even worse if uh, in some industries, if you're second to market, you only get a fraction of the value. So you've got to be first to market with that latest generation of that technology. So that is one thing to compare to ROI. It is not ROI. Active value, though, if we use this table, I'm deliberately using numbers that you'll see in the experience report from uh, Joshua and Uslam, and that you may have seen in other literature. I'm going to chart it in a different way than I think pretty much uh, all of those um, have done before me. Um, and we've got three features. We can only work on them one at a time, and they have these durations. This is how long it's going to take us and how much value it's going to, they're going to generate each per week once they're complete. So the way that that shows up graphically is a little bit like this for the first five periods. If we do them first in, first out, we're going to do A, and that occupies the five time periods. Then once we complete A, we can start working on B, and that's going to take us an extra period, an extra week. Meanwhile, while we're working on B, A is now active in value, so it generates its, its first million dollars. Fantastic. Then we finish B, so we start working on C, and both A and B, meanwhile, are generating value. Now, active value is the total value that has been activated so far. That is $11 signs, so $11 million. Peak value, it's a specific kind of active value for the set of things that we're considering, in this case, three features for a particular product, Peak value is when all of the three features are live. So now the peak value that the whole thing activates, all of the things being equal with no other information, assuming that the estimations are correct, or the number might be whatever the numbers are, but let's just simplify it and say that those are accurate. It will be $10 million per week. So after nine weeks, the total active value where the peak is 10 is 21 million, right? So it's the 11 that I showed earlier plus the additional 10 once we completed C. Is that okay? That's not bad, 21 million, and from that point forward, 10 million per period. All right. Uh, the value is the best guess. Uh, well, it might be. Uh, that might be a way to start, but it calibrates to uh, become more and more accurate uh, over time. What else did I miss? Uh, throughput value, time at constraint. There you go, from theory of constraints. Uh, inactive value. All right, let's define that. Well, inactive value is um, invisible in most organizations. In this particular case, if we were to do this work A, then B, then C, the inactive value is $50 million. There they are, 50 boxes, $50 signs. Can we do better than that? Well, the uh, those of you that uh, have seen some of this material before or uh, keen-eyed will see that this table already has the label value rate. So of course, um, we're going to do use that. And the way that we're going to use it is a value scale uh, in other um, groups and other contexts, this might also be known as um, mischief, a way to short the job first. But I particularly want to use value in the name of the thing because it is a value measure. And mischief does not give me information about what it's measuring. Also, no Fibonacci numbers. This has to be the real dollar value expected to be generated per period of time. So it's already millions of dollars per week or per unit of time, dollars per time. And the uncompressible duration, that is the correct duration to use, not the, well, I guess if we put one person on this, it might, we might do it in three months. No, this is, if this is the thing with, to be done without delay, what is the fastest that we could have it? And that is the duration in that duration column. So value scale is basically this additional dimension, which is the ratio of those two. But it, they've got to be those two, not some other duration, some other level of effort. None of those things work or cost. None of that works. It has to be uncompressible duration. Then you get a value scale and you sort them in the order of smallest to largest value scale. The scale is what is giving you, sorry, the largest to smallest, I, I misspoke. So B has a 4.0 ratio, 4 millions per uh, duration of uh, one week. So 4 millions per week, per one week of uh, uh, duration. So that is dollars per week per week. It's an acceleration right? It's per week squared. It's an acceleration metric. That's why I'm calling it value scale. So here, there is still a red area to the left of the diagram. It is inescapable. The only thing we can do is minimize it. But what have we done? We have captured an extra $42 million of active value. So that alone might double your profit within the same calendar year. And then you still have, of course, the other thing. Just grabbing all of that money that was left on the table might make a difference. But let me quickly show you at least one of these. Uh, maybe a few more looking at the time. What happens if we start late, if we lose focus, if we take two weeks to pick a product owner, they're not available uh, because, I don't know, they're traveling or whatever. 
Well, let's start with those case by case. Now, already I'm going to start with the absolute optimal. And this also uh, delivers the, the conveys the message that the peak value is what matters most. This is why. If this is the optimal sequence already, and we can't do any better than this, and then we're delayed by one week, we lose the peak value. There it is. We basically are stomping all over a peak value period that we're losing. It's actually not being lost on the left. It's being lost to the right, but it just shows a little better here. We lose the peak value. We add to the area to the left of the chart by $10 million. We don't lose the value of B. We don't use just a little bit. We lose one of the peak values. So knowing the peak value is the best uh, thing, a bit of information to make uh, these decisions. What about losing focus? We kind of think that we can do B in a week, but we lost focus and it actually took two weeks. Well, yet again, uh, B doesn't activate for an, an additional week and everything else is pushed back by a, a week. So you still lose a peak value. So peak value, no matter where you go, is what you lose. All right, one more. Product owner is not available or for some other reason. We, let's just say this time that we've done B and it's now the product owner for C that isn't available. Well, then if that is delayed by two weeks without a product owner, then we lose that value, which is now the peak of what remains. So it's not the total peak value of the whole thing because we already have B in market. And this is $12 million uh, by this chart. Now, somebody asked a clever question in one of these um, uh, sessions that I did uh, for a private uh, cohort program. And they said, well, since that's, you know, the product owner for C is unavailable, how about we just start with A instead? Well, assuming that once you start with something, you don't want to be switching back and forwards, then actually that's worse. If you, unless you know that C is going to be delayed by five weeks or more, you're not better off by starting A. You're better off by having the team build its infrastructure, sharpen their tools, and invest in future speed to make sure that all of the durations of all future work are shorter than starting with A. So this actually costs us, uh, what is that, five by five? $25 million. So double as much as this uh, example here, which was $12 million of loss. All right, finishing line is insight. So back to getting to value. What's a key point to get out of this? The total value lost that we're leaving on the table that is available for us to claim for free is the value rate, which is our estimate of dollars per week. It'll start bad, but it gets better real fast. And the total delay of weeks. So if you complete something that started to deliver $137,000 per week, but you waited for six weeks for a business analyst to become available because you needed a business analyst to, I don't know, document something, and you waited for six weeks, that's an $800,000 mistake. How many business analysts could you have, have hired for that amount of value that you squandered, that you didn't capture? Unless the team of business analysts was busy prioritizing something of even higher value in which case it's totally understandable, but there's still some money to be made left on the table. So basically, it looks a little bit like this, and that is the enormous area that we normally find of total value loss. To close off, some a quick experiment or a quick uh, example. Uh, this is work. Uh, it's actually uh, all of these are examples of work that I did with uh, Joshua in particular for a big client. And we were looking at the, you know, what is the idea. This is actually his um, layout uh, that you can uh, find on uh, blackstonefarming.com. So we had the idea, describing it, then doing, showing your work, showing the math, what are the benefits for the organization? You can see some of the numbers there. Uh, what are the benefit types? What is the urgency profile? You know, it's got delay cost in there. And the value rate, the dollars per week was 17,000. Now, if you compare that to something else that works out to be 15,000, well, that alone, even before we do value scale, that might already tell you one is more valuable than the other. One is going to activate 17, almost $18,000 of value per week. The other one, 15,000. So we can make decisions accordingly. Right. If two things take the same time to do, we know which one we would do first. We would do the one with the higher value rate. In practice, this is what we go through the program. Uh, this is what we quickly move to because we want to see the alternative profiles of value based on the different decisions that we could be making and the different uh, ways of scheduling, prioritizing, or sequencing our work. But we can only do this if we even begin to estimate value, even if it's bad, and then. People really get good at it because they have to get good at it so that the right work can get done rather than continuing to hemorrhage money. The biggest, one of the biggest examples that I had was actually in as mundane a topic as recycling. 
but it happened to be recycling in a very, very big uh, organization. And there were lots of different uh, devices being shipped and flown around the world. This is a picture from a FedEx plane that came down right about the time that I was doing this consulting. And I produce this uh, summary. And let me just talk you through the highlights. We're trying to avoid the loss of life when uh, from any number of stores around the world, uh, devices with perhaps old or faulty leaky batteries are being put into boxes to be sent back to recycling centers. And any of those could bring down a cargo plane if they uh, catch fire, if they explode or whatever. So um, I looked at what was paid to the victims or the families of the victims of that particular crash, that FedEx plane, and it was $10 million per member of the crew. The typical crew of such a plane is four people, so that's $40 million. That seems like a big number, but wait, protect brand and reputation. What if it wiped out one quarter's profit? Well, I grabbed that number and then uh, protect stock value and maybe profit is reduced by 10% for 10 years. I run all of these as a first guess and then calibrate it with the people that could reasonably uh, tell me what the right numbers were to arrive at a final uh, set of numbers. And they said, yeah, and then avoid regulatory fines, assume 5.2 million. That's actually the smallest of the numbers. Total, um, uh, 50 billion plus, which works out to about $962 million per week in the scale that we're trying to gauge here. And that number may be slightly different, but in terms of an order of magnitude, it's about a billion per week. So then we have to calculate the probability of a battery exploding, let's say one in a million. But how many recycled shipments have there been? And how many boxes um, have there been on average per shipment? That gives you the 12,000 boxes per week being moved. Reported probability of a loose battery found in a received box, 33%. So do the math. And this is a $3.85 million per week uh, life exposure as well, life-threatening um, opportunity. So once this was clear, it just removed all of the other priorities, at least for the duration of the work that needed to be done to make sure that this was completed and everything else was uh, made to wait. And there were like 11 stakeholders for this particular group. They all got it, they all backed off, and we did this without delay, and then everything was good. So that's it. I'll stick around for a few more minutes. It's right at our time. Thank you for participating if you've got to go or if you already went. And uh, well, anybody on the video that might be watching, this is my cohort program. This is a flavor of the first uh, module, uh, Business Value, and I really appreciate all of your time. If you're able to give me any feedback, uh, again, back on the uh, that link that I shared, you've got a session feedback link here that you can tell me exactly what you think about the session and anything that I may do to improve. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. And I will stay here for another five minutes if people want to pipe up and ask questions.